Hi, everyone. On behalf of the Open Table and the Good Food Institute, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Attract New Diners with Plant-Based Options. I'm Dawn Bruce, a Senior Manager on our Restaurant Marketing Team here at Open Table. Today I'm joined by Allison Rabshinuk, Director of Corporate Engagement at the Good Food Institute. Here at Open Table, we're proud to work with over 52,000 restaurants across the globe. My hope is that by partnering with thought leaders like the Good Food Institute, we can help provide useful, actionable content that you can bring back to your business. As someone that comes from a restaurant operations background prior to joining Open Table, I'm personally excited to have Allison here to discuss two very worthy causes, driving additional business and promoting sustainability within your restaurant. Allison's going to provide an overview of the Good Food Institute and their mission. She'll then dive into consumer demand around plant-based, some best practices for your menu, and we'll wrap by sharing a few of her favorite resources if you'd like to learn more. Additionally, if questions come to you during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box on your screen, and we'll be sure to address them at the end. Throughout the presentation, we've scattered a number of photos that highlight dishes from restaurants that have found success by adding plant-based options to their menu. We hope you'll take note of those and use them as inspiration. With that, I'm happy to hand things over to Allison. Thank you for the introduction, Don. The Good Food Institute is honored to partner with Open Table for this webinar, and I'd like to thank all of the attendees for taking the time to join us today. I'll be sharing with you all the reasons why it makes sense from a business perspective for restaurants to add plant-based dishes to menus, as well as insights into what consumers are looking for in these kinds of menu items. And lastly, how to best market them to your patrons. Before we start, I'd like to share a little about the Good Food Institute, which is also known as GFI, and the work that we do. We're a global nonprofit organization that's working on a solution to two pressing issues that are confronting the world, which are how to feed a growing population and how we combat climate change. From a population perspective, it's estimated that globally, it will increase from about 7 billion people today to around 10 billion people in 2050, which is only 30 years away. At GFI, we believe one of the best solutions to this issue, as well as climate change, is by focusing on the food system, specifically on replacements to animal meat. The more efficient process of feeding plant-based protein directly to humans instead of through animals will be what's required to feed 10 billion people. According to the UN report, Livestock's Long Shadow, the livestock sector is one of the top two or three most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems and is responsible for around 15% of greenhouse gas emissions, a higher share than the whole transportation sector, including planes, trains, and automobiles. By contrast, plant-based proteins have a much better environmental footprint. For example, we have reviewed research that shows that compared to a beef burger, some of the popular plant-based burgers use 72 to 98% less water, 47 to 99% less land, and contribute far less to water pollution. The production of plant-based burgers involves 30 to 90% fewer greenhouse gas emissions as well. GFI is not advocating for consumers to switch from eating animals to lentils, as we know that's very unlikely to occur. Behavior change is very hard, especially when it comes to food. Instead, GFI promotes meat, eggs, and dairy that are made from plants. They are products produced using plant ingredients like proteins, fats, and carbohydrates to subtly or directly mimic the structure and taste of conventional meat, eggs, or dairy. Our thesis is that consumers don't need to stop eating meat, but rather that meat can be made in a way that is more efficient, sustainable, and healthy from plants instead of animals. There are a lot of terms that people use to describe how they eat. We have omnivores, flexitarians, politarians, pescatarians, vegetarians, vegans, reducitarians, and many more terms that describe people's diets. Which of these types of consumers does plant-based eating appeal to? The answer is all of the above. In fact, sales of plant-based foods in grocery stores and in restaurants are being driven by flexitarian consumers, those who eat meat, poultry, and seafood 
but who were actively trying to eat less and instead eat more plant-based foods. Most of the companies making plant-based products aren't targeting vegans or vegetarians. Rather, they are targeting all consumers. And that's a really important point for anyone running a restaurant because the prospective audience for plant-based dishes goes from only 10% of the population who are vegan and vegetarian to 90% of the population who are omnivorous and flexitarian. The business opportunity becomes much more apparent. You might be asking yourself why there's been so much focus lately on plant-based food when veggie burgers, tofu, and tempeh have been around for a very long time. Well, we like to explain it as plant-based 1.0 and plant-based 2.0. 1.0 describes the era when most of the meat alternatives were indeed created for and consumed by vegans and vegetarians. Some of the products were very good and others were quite bland, rubbery, or dry. The food had connotations of hippies, sprouts, and activists. Many consumers equated these foods to deprivation and sacrifice. Fast forward to today, where plant-based foods are mainstream and delicious. There are many reasons why plant-based is so hot right now, but really it comes down to increased consumer demand and improved product supply. More consumers are reducing their intake of animal protein and increasing plant protein consumption for health, environmental reasons, taste, and others. And in the marketplace, both in grocery stores and restaurants, they now offer consumers better and more meat-like plant-based products that have expanded the appeal of this category from niche to mainstream. There has been a tremendous amount of innovation to get us to this point. Companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods took a very different approach than earlier companies by, number one, making products to appeal to all consumers, not just vegans and vegetarians. And number two, because they wanted to appeal to all consumers, they focused on creating products that 100% mimic animal meat, but are made from 100% plant ingredients. They hired meat scientists and sought to replicate all the sensory aspects of meat, from how it tastes, how it looks, how it cooks, and how it smells. Their goal was to have consumers choose their products without having to sacrifice on taste. For restaurants wanting to add plant-based dishes, is using plant-based meat the only solution? Not at all. There are a variety of culinary solutions that range from using whole food ingredients like legumes, mushrooms, vegetables, and grains. Many restaurants also choose to use tofu, tempeh, and seitan as protein-rich meat substitutes that are really great in a variety of dishes. And more veggie-centric products like the more traditional black bean burgers are still widely used and loved by consumers. But the sales in both retail and food service has pointed to meat mimics as having the highest velocity, probably because those products are appealing to many diners who wouldn't consider lentils, tofu, or black bean burgers. They're looking for foods that are very familiar in taste and format and that they know will be filling and satisfying. There have been many studies done to identify the reasons for the shift to plant-based eating and reasons why consumers are buying plant-based meat specifically. As you can see from this chart, the six studies represented here consistently show health benefits as the top reason. What do we mean by health? It can mean consumers are looking to reduce their dietary cholesterol. It can mean they are being advised to add more fiber to their diet. It can also mean that consumers see plant-based diets as a great way to lose weight and or maintain weight. Plant-based is a cue for health. While environmental and ethical reasons do appear as motivations for plant-based eating as well, they do rank a lot lower than health. When you look at these numbers from a generation perspective, there are definitely differences. Baby boomers, not surprisingly, rank health higher than other demographics. And younger generations like millennials and Gen Z rank the environment and animal welfare higher than older demographics do. Consumers also turn to plant-based eating for the specific reason of wanting to reduce their consumption of meat. Some of the top reasons for doing so include the cost of animal meat, and again, 
health concerns. What's really critical though, and this is important for you as a chef, is that taste is still the top driver. The health, environmental, and ethical concerns are important, but if the dishes don't taste great, then they won't sell. Research from the Harvard School of Public Health and Johns Hopkins shows that eating plant-based foods can lower one's risk of heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and stroke. Plant-based foods add fiber, unlike animal meat, which has no fiber, and eliminates dietary cholesterol. U.S. News & World Report has consistently ranked plant-based diets as one of the best diets for weight loss and weight management. The caveat that I will include here is that there is a wide spectrum of plant-based products with differing levels of saturated fat and calories. Plant-based is usually a proxy for healthier. You all have different restaurant concepts and formats, and it's important to add plant-based dishes that are similar to your other menu options from a health perspective. Research company Mintel released a study a few years ago that measured the desired attributes of meat alternatives, and protein content was by far the top attribute. From my own personal experience, this is often where restaurants fall short when they develop plant-based entrees. I can't tell you the number of times I've been given just a plate of vegetables or a huge bowl of pretty plain pasta. I encourage you to go beyond the salad, go beyond just vegetables, and remember that all consumers are looking for protein. We all know that people are consuming more than their fair share of protein, but if that's what they're seeking, then let's give them what they want. Many meat substitutes have high protein content. For example, a field roast sausage has 25 grams. A Beyond Burger has 20 grams. Edamame has around 18 grams per cup, as do lentils. Quinoa has 8 grams per cup. There are many ways to incorporate protein-rich, plant-based foods into meals. We'll be speaking about this later in the presentation, but I wanted to highlight the right side of this chart which points out that consumers' least desired attribute for meat alternatives is the term vegan. This backs up my earlier point that consumers equate veganism and vegetarianism to deprivation, sacrifice, and in some cases, bad tasting food. 2018 and 2019 have been banner years for sales of plant-based foods, specifically meat alternatives, in both retail and in food service. On the retail side, plant-based foods, which we define as replacements for animal foods, thinking plant-based meat, plant-based milk, and other dairy products, and also including plant-based eggs. The retail side saw a 32% two-year increase in grocery stores as tracked by SPINs. According to FMI, which is a retail trade group, two-thirds of U.S. consumers now buy meat alternatives at grocery stores or are interested in trying them. We also have research showing that this shift is not confined to only urban areas or only to the coast. We've seen double-digit increases of sales of plant-based foods in all nine U.S. census regions. Now looking at the details on this slide, I'm sure you've heard a lot about these launches represented here, where top chains have added an Impossible or Beyond Burger to their menu. This is just a sample and doesn't include some of the current tests in restaurants like McDonald's in Canada and Denny's to name a few. Needless to say, restaurants are quickly trying to catch up to the demand that is out there and wanting to capitalize on the potential for increased foot traffic by offering plant-based options. Data from companies like NPD and Dining Alliance back up this increased demand by showing a 268% growth of meat alternative sales, a 26% growth in the number of restaurants serving a meat alternative, and a 20% growth in plant-based protein case shipments from broadline distributors. At the Good Food Institute, over the past three years, we've been tracking the top 100 restaurant chains as determined by Nation's Restaurant News, to see how many of them offer plant-based entrees and how they market them to mainstream consumers. 
The first report we published showed only 35 restaurants having at least one plant-based entree. Last year, it went up to 45, and this year, we're on track to report 55 of those top 100 offering at least one plant-based entree. You can find all these results and resources at our website, www.goodfoodscorecard.org. Most of the restaurants are using some kind of plant-based meat ingredient, but there's a lot of opportunity beyond that to include some of the other protein sources I mentioned earlier. We have a dozen case studies published on our Good Food Scorecard site that I encourage you to read. Here is one from Manhattan-based Saxon and Parole. Their executive chef, Brad Farmery, highlights the new customer acquisition that the launch of their Impossible Burger provided. Before discussing the question of how to menu plant-based dishes, let's discuss the definitions of plant-based versus plant-forward, two terms that are sometimes used interchangeably but that are different. Plant-based describes dishes that don't contain any animal ingredients, what's been historically known as vegan. Plant forward, which is a term that the Culinary Institute of America's Menus of Change initiative popularized, means an emphasis and celebration of plant-based foods, but not limited to just plant-based foods. Plant forward typically means smaller portions of animal meat, say going from eight ounces to four ounces. When deciding what kinds of plant-based or plant forward dishes your restaurant should create, it obviously depends on many variables, such as your culinary format, how much time your staff can devote to preparation, the limits of your kitchen, and the limits of your ingredient budget. There is no one-size-fits-all suggestion. It's obvious why many quick-service restaurants are adding burgers to their menus. It's a menu item that their customers already expect from those restaurants, and it fits within their cooking equipment. In most cases, the quick service restaurants are passing the higher ingredient cost onto the consumer. In different kinds of restaurant formats, chefs are adding whole foods dishes, incorporating grains, legumes, and vegetables. Another case study we developed with chef Matthew Kenny highlighted that their plant-based ingredient costs are 20% of the final dish price as compared to the industry average of 30%. Again, the ingredient cost will vary depending on whether you are using legumes as the protein or impossible meat as the protein, but you should be able to find a solution from one of the many plant proteins that works within your budget. There was a great quote I recently heard from someone at NPD. He said, the American consumer absolutely loves to try something new, especially if they're already familiar with it. This is key. As I mentioned earlier, most of the dishes that are selling the fastest are ones that are familiar to consumers. I suggest looking at your existing menu and identifying dishes that could easily be modified to be plant-based. Maybe instead of a dish with shrimp or chicken, allow a diner to add a plant-based protein like garden chicken, tofu, or a scoop of edamame beans. In our analysis of the top 100 restaurants, the top 10 most common menu items could easily be made plant-based by substituting the protein. Whether it's a burger, wrap, deli sandwich, taco, burrito, or pizza, there are very easy ways to make delicious plant-based versions. Once you've created your new plant-based menu items, make sure to position them as flavorful and indulgent. Scream flavor and whisper health. There was a study done at Stanford that compared four descriptive terms to the same plate of green beans to see which descriptor led to the most sales. Without boring you with all the details, the winning description was sweet, sizzling green beans and crispy shallots, which was ordered 41% more times than the healthy restrictive label of light and low-carb green beans and shallots. 
Remember that the fact that a dish is plant-based is what cues health for the consumer. There's no need to overemphasize that point. Continuing with the marketing of these dishes, the naming is very powerful and important. Panera recently conducted a study with the World Resources Institute, which tested the renaming of their low-fat vegetarian black bean soup to Cuban black bean soup. That simple naming change resulted in a 13% lift in sales. WRI has done other research and found that highlighting the nationality, regionality, and preparation method has high correlations with increased sales. Many restaurants who do have plant-based dishes often put them into a different part of their menu and highlight that they are vegan or vegetarian. Research has shown, however, that when plant-based dishes are integrated with other dishes on a menu, that they are ordered twice as often. Those consumers who truly are vegan or vegetarian will be able to deduce that a dish will work for them. It could be as simple as putting a small letter V or a leaf next to the dish, but calling it out as vegan or vegetarian will surely reduce sales from omnivore consumers. Research also shows that terms like meat-free and meatless aren't likely to lead to sales as there's a sense that the dishes are missing something. Building on that last point, this survey shows the term plant-based has so much more positive connotations than vegan from a taste perspective, from a health perspective, and from a personal identity perspective. Consumers see vegan as a lifestyle more than a kind of cuisine, whereas plant-based is seen as a style of cooking. As we saw earlier in the presentation, consumers are looking to have protein in their meals, and you should emphasize the plant protein in the names or descriptions of the dishes to increase sales. The mention of plant ingredients and the mention of plant protein cues health and satiety. Some restaurants will call out pea protein or plant protein as ways of highlighting this on their menus. In addition to calling out the protein, meat-like flavors are desired attributes by consumers when eating meat alternatives. If there's a way to highlight the connection to an animal product that the dish is substituting, that's a good way to familiarize the dish to the consumer. The yard house, for example, uses chicken as a term to describe the many dishes that use the plant-based protein from Gardein. They offer Gardein mac and cheese, Gardein orange chicken as two such examples. And here we are at the summary of the points from today's presentation. What I hope you will take away are that flexitarians, not vegans, are driving the growth of plant-based foods, that meat mimics, although they've been around for decades, are hot now because of the product innovation, that plant-based sales are booming in retail and food service because of the increased supply and demand, that despite health motivations behind consumers choosing more plant-based foods, taste is still as essential as ever, that familiar versus novel is what sells. You don't need to recreate the wheel. Look at your existing menu and make protein substitutions. Integrate, don't segregate. So there's no need to point out the lack of animal meats in the menu items and no need to put them in the, their own section of the menu. Use plant-based instead of vegan to attract all kinds of diners. And lastly, highlight the protein and the meaty flavors. Now I'd like to share with you some key resources to help you as you start navigating plant-based foods within your own restaurant concept. First, you can visit our Good Food Institute website at gfi.org. You can go to our Good Food Scorecard website, which is www.goodfoodscorecard.org, where you can read some of the dozen plant-based case studies as well as find other resources. You can also take advantage of the Culinary Institute of America's new Plant Forward Kitchen platform. 
an education and digital media initiative full of culinary resources. That's at plantforwardkitchen.org. You can attend the Global Plant Forward Culinary Summit, which is April 29th to May 1st, 2020, at the CIA at Copia in Napa, California. You'll gain hands-on experience in a plant-forward kitchen, learn how to infuse your menu with on-trend, craveable plant-forward choices, and learn techniques from global cuisines and cultures that have been plant-forward for centuries. You could also attend the 8th Annual Menus of Change Leadership Summit where you'll gain scientific and consumer insights along with business strategies, industry case studies, and menu innovation to help advance healthy, sustainable, delicious food choices throughout your restaurant operation. Details can be found at menusofchange.org. You can also get inspiration from leading chefs and innovators of the Plant Forward Culinary Movement by visiting plantforward50.com. And lastly, coming soon, you can get certified in plant-forward culinary arts. You can train yourself or your staff in the unique techniques and flavor profiles of plant-forward cooking through an exciting new program, the CIA's Plant-Forward Culinary Arts Education and Certification Initiative. To learn more, please watch for news at the CIA's Plant-Forward Kitchen website in the fall of 2020. Thanks, Allison, for all of that information. At this time, let's go over to questions. Hey everyone, I apologize, there were some technical difficulties a minute ago. You may not have heard um, some of the responses that I was addressing here on the Q&A. Um, so, just to reiterate, to make sure everyone on the phone heard, um, we have got numerous questions from folks asking about getting a copy of the slides or the webinar so that they can refer back later. Um, the answer to that is yes. You will be receiving an email from OpenTable either later this evening or tomorrow that will have a full recording of this webinar with the slides, as well as some links to the key resources that Allison just uh, went over in the presentation. So you will all be getting those. Um, one other question that has come in from Tony, and this question is for you, Allison. Um, the question is, currently we see more guests asking for low-carb, like paleo or keto options, versus plant-based. How do you see the two working together? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I have seen a lot of recipes that are vegan and uh, paleo. They call it pegan. <laughs> so I think there is a way to make them work. Uh, I'm not a chef, so I can't advise on specific recipes. But I think it might also just be important to have, you know, just a variety of dishes on your menu uh, that appeal to people following all kinds of dietary uh, choices. Um, and Allison, one other question that I that uh, I have listed elsewhere that sort of piggybacks off that, and I think it's related to Tony's question, is, um, you know, is having a dish with optional proteins that include a plant-based protein a good idea on your menu? So, for instance, maybe offering a dish that. Um, you could have with either chicken or perhaps you have it with tofu or something like that. Is that a, a popular or recommended option? Absolutely. So I think instead of just putting one dish on your menu, which might be plant-based, 
Uh, we've seen some restaurants have the options of adding proteins like uh, shrimp and chicken, as well as a plant-based option. So it could be anything, I think as I mentioned earlier, like a garden chicken strip. It could be, um, you know, tofu, tempeh, what, whatever it is, I think giving consumers the option to customize their dishes is, is something that's obviously on trend and a good way to, you know, for you as a chef to uh, add plant-based in a fairly easy way. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and another question that kind of piggybacks on that, uh, Hassan from Le Colonial asks, what do you recommend in terms of the ratio of plant-based food menu options, um, and I assume versus like um, meat or other protein options on the menu? Uh, my dream would be 100%. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, I, honestly, I don't know that I have a recommended amount. I think a lot of it depends on your your customers. Uh, but as I as you saw from the research, you know, a lot of diners of, of all ages, of all generations, of all demographics are looking for these dishes. So I would say that if you're a restaurant that currently has zero plant-based options, um, you know, moving up to 15 to 20 percent would probably be ideal. Um, and I think it's also just important to give variety. So, you know, if you do have a burger on your menu, maybe consider adding a plant-based burger swap as an option, but maybe also consider other kinds of ideas. Um, I think a combination of both, you know, a dish that includes meat substitutes as well as one that uses more whole foods plant-based uh, would be some great options as well. Perfect. Um, it looks like one more person did chime in asking if we were going to share the slides. So just to address that one more time, we will be sending those via email, either um, this evening or tomorrow, along with some other resources. Um, I do have another question kind of teed up as well, Allison. Um, the question was, you know, earlier in your presentation, you recommend that you know, chefs don't necessarily call out vegan or vegetarian options on the menu, right? You said integrate, um, don't segregate. So when a diner comes in looking for those types of options and they specifically ask, like, how do you, how would you suggest a restaurant address that? Like, maybe have a separate printed menu or, or is it staff training? What does that look like? Sure. I don't think it's necessary to have a separate menu. Um, again, if, you, if, if you're concerned about vegans specifically, um, it's important, again, to realize that we're talking about a really small percentage of the population. And I do understand that they can be quite vocal. So you want to make sure that you're able to communicate which dishes are indeed vegan. Um, but as I mentioned, it, I think it really can be handled in a very subtle way just by using a small V uh, or a PB for plant-based, however you typically uh, mark you know, other types of items on your menu, maybe gluten-free, follow something a, a, kind of a similar format to that. If you look at even Chipotle, you know, they use a small letter V to indicate that their Sofritas dish uh, is actually vegan. Perfect, thank you. Um, Another question that came through is, um, I, I think early in the presentation you mentioned something about, um, you know, an, uh, an easier, maybe more obvious way to start offering something plant-based would, would be to replace a familiar dish. So, you know, perhaps you have a really popular burger on the menu, offering a plant-based version of a burger is a great way to do that. Um, if you don't have that kind of obvious replacement item, like a burger, what's your recommendation there? Yeah, I would definitely check out the resources that the Culinary Institute offers. They have thousands of recipes that are that are free and available online. Um, and, and again, you know, I think there is no, there's not going to be a one size fits all recommendation. Um, I'm sure everyone on this call has a slightly different menu and a different kind of concept. So I think it's important to, you know, work within your own culinary concept. Um, you know your own customers. So whatever ingredients you have on hand, you know, it really can literally be as simple as swapping out an ingredient or two to make it plant-based. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think this requires a complete overhaul of a kitchen uh, or the ingredients. It's really just understanding that a lot of diners are looking to reduce their consumption of animal ingredients and increase their consumption of plant ingredients. Perfect. Thank you for that. 
Um, at this time, it doesn't look like we have any new questions um, in the Q&A box. I'm going to give it one more second here. If anyone has any last questions, please go ahead and add those at this point in time. Um, and then one last time, I do want to thank everybody for joining us. And thank you, Allison, um, for taking the time to uh, join us as well. Ooh, it looks um, actually like we got one more question in uh, under the wire here. So let me go ahead and get that over to you, Allison. Um, Hassan asked, to elevate the taste of plant-based options, chefs could venture more in authentic excellent cuisines that excel in tasty vegan options. So that's actually more of a recommendation, but um, I, I think that's something that, Allison, I, you know, do, do you agree that that's um, a very popular and, and good way to kind of try to introduce absolutely. more options? A yeah, absolutely. Like, there have been... Yeah, a lot, a lot of ethnic cuisines have been focused on vegan options uh, for millennia. Um, a really great place to get a sense of this, too, is at that Culinary Institute Global Plant Forward Summit that I mentioned. The next one is uh, this spring in Napa, California. And that is, is absolutely the focus, which is looking at ethnic cuisines from around the world um, and highlighting things like uh, legumes and vegetables and, and ancient grains. Perfect. Yes, that is um, a fantastic recommendation and um, definitely makes sense to me. Um, Mayor Nas writes, um, it looks like may not be a restaurateur, but writes that I have developed a plant-based burger similar to Beyond Meat with a shorter ingredient list. Could a restaurant be a good channel to launch that? Um, Allison, since you guys do focus on retail and that end of the spectrum too, or distributions and restaurants, I think that's a great question for you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, food service is a great place for new brands to launch uh, as it also allows them to uh, potentially customize and, and reformulate based on consumer uh, input. Another idea, too, that I don't think I mentioned during the presentation, but that is actually quite popular in a lot of restaurants, is the concept of blended products. So the James Beard Foundation, um, as probably many of you know, runs a, a contest for the best blended burger. Um, and that's been something that's, that's been very successful. We're also seeing a lot of products in retail um, from some of the meat companies like Purdue and Tyson uh, launch blended products. So that's a wonderful way of adding some umami flavor, maybe through the addition of mushrooms uh, or legumes to, to add more fiber uh, and, and a good source of protein. Perfect. Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm going to pause just one more second here and see if we have any last questions that come through. Well, it looks like that's a wrap. Um, again, Allison, thank you for joining us and thanks to you and your colleagues at the Good Food Institute for providing some fantastic information. Um, personally speaking on behalf of Open Table, I'm very excited. Um, that we were able to partner here and hope that we can partner again for future opportunities. Um, again, for those of you that attended, thank you very much for taking the time to attend. Um, we will be distributing the recordings. We will be distributing some additional resources. Um, additionally, in the um, presenter bios, you can find email addresses for both Allison and myself. Um, should you have any follow-up questions, we'd be happy to help with those. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end the webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.